Hi, I'm Brad, you're watching Hello From Space, and today we're gonna to be diving into something I'm really excited about. Australia's very own attempt at building and launching an orbital rocket. And this isn't just any rocket. If successful, it will be the first rocket to reach orbit using hybrid rocket engines. Now it's called Eris, and it's being developed by a company called Gilmore Space Technologies, literally just 20 minutes down the road from my home here on the Gold Coast in Australia. So in this video, we're gonna be taking a look at the rocket itself, its purpose, what makes it special, then we're gonna take a deeper dive into these unique and honestly potentially revolutionary hybrid rocket engines. We'll also talk about how Eris is built, what it's made of, what happened during its maiden flight earlier this year, and Gilmore Space's pretty ambitious plans heading into the future. So let's meet Eris. Now, Eris is a three-stage small satellite launch vehicle. Now, at full height, it's about 23 to 25 metres tall, around the same as a seven-storey apartment block, and about two metres wide at its base. Now, fully fueled, it tips the scales at around 30 tonnes. So while it's much smaller than a Falcon 9 or Ariane 6, it's very much in the same league as rockets like Rocket Lab's Electron, or Fireflies Alpha, or Astra's Rocket 3 series. Now, its payload capacity sits about 300 kilos to low Earth orbit. That's more than enough for a single medium-sized Earth observation satellite or a cluster of smaller CubeSats. Now, the small satellite launch market is exactly where Eris is aimed. Now, Gilmore's roadmap doesn't just stop there, though. Now, they're already working on a larger variant, Eris Block 2, that could loft about a metric tonne, and they've actually even floated ideas for an Eris Heavy with payloads of up to four tonnes. Now, that would put Australia in a completely new category for space access. And what's really exciting is that all of this is being built, tested, and launched right here in Australia, from the Bowen Orbital Spaceport in North Queensland. Now, this is my home country's first orbital launch site, purpose-built for Eris. Now, it's worth pausing on this for a second because this is a massive milestone. Australia has dabbled in rocketry since the Woomera days back in the 1960s, but Eris is the first serious homegrown attempt to reach orbit in over 50 years. Now, on July 30th, 2025, Eris made its very first attempt at flight. Now, all four of its first stage serious hybrid rocket engines roared to life and the rocket lifted off the pad. Now, for about 14 seconds, everything looked good, but then things started to go a little sideways, literally. Now, one engine dropped offline almost immediately after liftoff, and that meant the rocket was flying with just enough thrust to keep climbing, sort of more hovering, really. Now, then, when a second engine faltered, Eris simply didn't have enough power left to fight gravity. Now, on impact, it didn't explode in a spectacular fireball like some of the rocket failures you might have seen. Now, ISAR Aerospace's maiden flight of their Spectrum rocket from earlier this year comes to mind here. Uh, the footage of which, by the way, is mind-blowingly beautiful. Probably the most scenic rocket launch location in the world. It looks like something from a Bond film. Anyway, Eris-1 instead basically hovered before coming down at a controlled, unfortunately doomed descent, where it was destroyed inside its safety zone. Now, it's easy to focus on the fact that it failed to reach orbit, but actually, this test flight was still a big success. Almost every other system, guidance, avionics, the spaceport infrastructure worked exactly as intended. Now, I would also note that the attitude control system and avionics did heroic work to keep the rocket upright, correcting for the thrust asymmetry caused by two of its four engines failing in rapid succession. Now, CEO Adam Gilmore compared it to the early days of SpaceX and Rocket Lab, who also needed multiple test flights before cracking orbit. In other words, this is very much a learning curve moment with new technology. And it proved something crucial, that hybrid engines can work at scale, which brings us to the heart of this video. Now, most rockets you've probably heard of use one of two propulsion systems. 
Now, either solid rocket motors, good examples being the Space Shuttle and SLS's SRBs, as well as ULA's Atlas V AJ-60A boosters, or liquid rocket engines, good examples being Falcon 9's Merlin 1D, or the Space Shuttle's RS-25, even Rocket Lab's Rutherford engine. But Gilmore Space is betting on a third way, hybrid rocket engines. So how do these work? Well, a hybrid rocket engine uses a solid fuel grain inside the combustion chamber with a liquid oxidizer pumped in from a tank. Once a spark ignites the fuel, the oxidizer flowing in keeps the surface burning, generating thrust. Flip off the oxidizer and the engine goes quiet. Simple, but brilliant. Now, why is this better? Firstly, safety. Now, the solid fuel in a hybrid engine is completely inert on its own, meaning it won't explode if you drop a spanner on it. Now, combustion only begins when the oxidizer is introduced, which makes hybrids inherently safer to manufacture and store compared to traditional solid boosters. Then there's the oxidizer itself. Now, liquid oxygen, or LOX, while less chemically reactive than the oxidizer used in Eris, which is hydrogen peroxide, it must be stored under extreme cold and high pressure, around minus 183 degrees Celsius and up to six atmospheres of pressure. Now, the high pressure helps slightly reduce boil off, but its main purpose is to ensure a reliable flow to the engines, since LOX or liquid oxygen is cryogenic. The hydrogen peroxide, however, is pretty happy to sit at room temperature and it doesn't require high pressure storage, making it far simpler and lighter to handle on the rocket. Secondly, throttle control. Now, this is a huge advantage. Unlike solid rockets, which burn at full blast until empty and cannot be shut down once lit, hybrids can be throttled up and down by just adjusting the oxidizer flow. Now, this gives them much of the finesse and control of liquid engines. And thirdly, simplicity. Now, liquid engines usually need expensive turbo pumps, cryogenic plumbing, and high precision systems. Hybrids just don't. Eris uses far simpler oxidizer feed systems with far fewer moving parts. Now, less parts in general, but particularly moving parts, means less potential value points and less cost. Then fourth off, restart capability. Now, shut off the oxidizer, the engine stops, open the valve again, and you can restart it. That's just something that's impossible with a pure solid motor. So why hasn't everyone else done this already? Well, the catch has always been performance. Now, hybrids historically suffered from inefficient combustion and even uneven burning. This meant they just didn't produce enough thrust for orbital rockets. Now, most hybrid rockets before Eris were only used for sounding rockets or suborbital flights. What Gilmore has managed to do, however, is refine the combustion chamber design, the grand geometry, and the oxidizer injection to get stable, high thrust performance. Now, their Sirius engine family has been tested up to 115 kilonewtons of thrust in long duration firings, the largest hybrid engine ever test fired. Now, is that good? Well, let's compare this to Rocket Lab's Rutherford engine, which I mentioned earlier. Now, the Rutherford is powered by electric pumps, which makes it far simpler and cheaper to produce than a classic liquid rocket engine. It's probably a pretty good comparator to the Sirius to really drive home the point I'm about to make. Now, since cost to orbit is the number one factor in modern spaceflight, let's compare the costs versus thrust of these two engines. Now, I need to put a caveat on this though. <laughs> Neither Rocket Lab nor Gilmore have publicly put out cost numbers of these engines. That being said, they have put out payload costs, which we can use to roughly, and I mean roughly, work backwards from. Basically, I'm working with the information that I have. Now, we're going to be using the sea level thrust numbers here. Now, Rocket Lab's Rutherford engine produces 25.8 kilonewtons of thrust for a rough cost of between 150 and 250,000 US dollars per engine. So, for simplicity's sake, we'll just pin that in the middle at 200,000 per engine. Now, Gilmore's Sirius engine, on the other hand, produces 115 kilonewtons of thrust for a rough cost of between 500,000 and a million US dollars per engine. Now, again, for simplicity's sake, let's pin that in the middle too at about 750,000 per engine. And if we use this to work out the cost per kilonewton of thrust, the Rutherford works out to around the $7,750,000 per kilonewton. The Sirius, however, works out to about $6,500 per kilonewton of thrust. The Sirius actually works out about 17% cheaper per kilonewton than the Rutherford. 
in space flight, engineers wet themselves over a 1% improvement. So 17% is massive. Now, as I mentioned, the Rutherford is itself a super advanced, simplistic and cost-effective design, even for a liquid rocket engine. Now, add to this as well, Rocket Lab is pretty well established and has to date produced over 500 Rutherford engines. Now, scale makes a huge difference to cost. Now, Gilmore's Sirius is really in the very early stages of its infancy. Now, if they can get that cost down further with more production, it'll only get better. And if Eris reaches orbit, it will be the first hybrid-powered orbital rocket in history. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Eris is a three-stage rocket, with the first stage using a cluster of four of these Sirius rocket engines we've been talking about. And the second stage also uses a Sirius engine. However, this one has been vacuum optimized with an extended nozzle for maximum efficiency in the vacuum of space. In the same way that SpaceX's Merlin and Raptor engines have vacuum optimized versions for use in the vacuum of space. Now, Eris's third stage, however, uses its Phoenix engine, a Kerolox liquid engine. Now, this engine is also designed and built in-house by Gilmore. Now, you might be thinking, why go to all the effort of developing hybrid engines just to throw a liquid engine on top of them? Well, the reason is ISP. Now, Eris's upper or third stage is its orbital insertion stage. Now, the Sirius engine, while a bit of a jack of all trades, does lack in one area in particular, ISP or specific impulse. Now, this is essentially the engine's efficiency. Now, while no figures have been publicly announced, we can make some pretty decent ballpark estimations based on other similar engines that have been developed or test fired. Now, the Sirius likely has an ISP of between 280 and 310 seconds in its vacuum optimized version. Now, the Phoenix engine, however, is likely closer to 320 or 330 seconds. Now, a higher ISP means you don't need to carry as much fuel to achieve the same delta V or speed increase. Now, the minimum speed to reach stable low Earth orbit or LEO is 7.8 kilometers per second. Not exactly slow. Now, higher ISP or efficiency essentially means you're getting more work done for the same amount of fuel, reducing the amount that you have to take with you. Now, due to the tyranny of the rocket equation, this has a large flow on effect particularly in the upper stage. Now, if the third stage, for instance, has low ISP, it means it needs to take more fuel with it to achieve LEO, well, this means the second stage now has to lift more mass with all that extra fuel weight, meaning it now needs more fuel too. So now both upper stages have more mass, which the first stage needs more fuel to lift as well, this starts to spiral pretty quickly. Having even a slightly higher ISP in the upper stage means taking some of the load off the lower stages and providing a higher payload to orbit. Even a small difference helps make the rocket smaller, lighter and cheaper with a higher payload to orbit. Now, building an orbital class rocket from scratch in Australia is no small feat. There is virtually no spaceflight infrastructure here. Gilmore's having to start pretty much from scratch. Now, they employ over 200 staff and work with more than 500 suppliers across the country. Now, many of their engineers previously worked at Rocket Lab on Virgin Orbit and Firefly Aerospace, bringing quite a bit of valuable experience to the table. Gilmore chose the hard path to do it themselves and essentially trailblaze and orbital rocket industry in Australia all on their own. You really have to admire that sort of ambition and commitment. This isn't easy stuff, it's rocket science. Now, Gilmore hasn't disclosed every detail, but based on industry practice, it's highly likely that Eris uses a mix of aerospace grade aluminium alloys for its tanks and structural elements with carbon composites in areas like the payload fairing. Now that combination keeps the rocket strong yet lightweight. The first stage is about two meters in diameter, tapering to 1.5 meters for the upper stages. Now payload fairings can be either 1.2 or 1.5 meters across, depending on the customer needs. Now prior to the maiden flight, Gilmore carried out hundreds of static firings. Now their early G70 test engine first fired back in 2018, but by 2022, they were breaking records with 100 second burns of engines producing over 100 kilonewtons of thrust. They also completed a full wet dress rehearsal in 2024, 
proving out fueling and countdown procedures before the big day. Then there's the Bowen Orbital Spaceport. Now this site built on Queensland's Abbott Point is Australia's first true orbital launch facility. Now Gilmore constructed a mobile launch platform, ground systems, and all the infrastructure needed to make orbital launches routine. Now, this is a major investment, not just in their own rocket, but in Australia's future as a spacefaring nation. Now beyond that, Gilmore's roadmap is pretty ambitious. Now, as I mentioned earlier, second up would be Eris Block 2, a bigger version able to carry a metric ton or 1,000 kilograms. And after that, Eris Heavy, able to carry up to four metric tons, potentially even crew capable in the long term. Now I'll note this is long term as it'll likely need more payload capability than four tons to carry a human rated spacecraft to orbit. Now, the Crew Dragon, for instance, has a wet mass of 12 tons. Now, this is exactly how companies like SpaceX started. Small steps, quick learning cycles, and scaling up over time. Eris might be Australia's Falcon 1 moment. So there you have it, Eris. Definitely more than just another small sat rocket. Now, eyes are going to be on Gilmore for their next few tests, but they've proven they are not messing around. They have every intention to become a serious player in the rocket industry. I'm personally really excited to see Eris 2, which is currently slated for early next year in 2026. I'm actually pretty seriously thinking about heading up to the orbital spaceport at Bowen to see it in person. But there's not a lot of opportunities in my corner of the world to see rocket launches in person. By not a lot, I mean literally none. So I would be really keen to go see it. Now, if you liked or found this video interesting, go ahead and click on one of my other videos. It should be popping up on the screen in a minute. And if you like those and want to see more, go ahead and hit the sub button. I'm trying to get these videos out every two weeks. I've been working really hard in the background on streamlining sort of production so I can get these things out on time every two weeks. Future Brad here. I just wanted to quickly pop in and mention that I now have a merch store. Looks nothing crazy or wild, just some cool sort of classic space sort of science-y related shirts, as well as a couple that I come up with myself. I particularly like, my personal favorite is the Nuclear Fusion shirt, which has a couple of hydrogen atoms that have been cable tied together. Probably my other favorite is the not unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine mug. Look, to be totally honest, I have a couple of things I'd like to purchase for the channel, in particular a new camera so I can sort of improve the quality of the videos. I thought this might be a really great opportunity to give you guys an opportunity to support the channel if you're so inclined while getting yourself some cool stuff in the process. Now, because it's a brand new store, everything is 25% off for the first two weeks. So if that's something that you'd be so inclined to do, I'd be really appreciative. Get yourself some cool stuff and uh, support what I'm trying to do here as well. Anyway, that's it for me. Thanks for watching. Have an awesome week and I'll see you next time.